So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context here. The, um, the, uh, the new COVID-19 uh, virus, coronavirus disease 19, um, is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses that generally cause upper respiratory infections. Uh, what we know about coronaviruses is that there are many of them. They are ubiquitous, mostly in animals, but they have they frequently jump species to uh, to humans. And um, we've had two major coronavirus outbreaks of note globally: um, SARS, uh, which occurred back in uh, 2003, 2002, 2003, uh, and uh, that is the um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, and that one was, uh, we had about 8,000 cases, we had 774 deaths, and so the case fatality rate was around 10 percent, 9.5. Um, it was controlled after about a year and a half. Um, we know that it came from uh, uh, horseshoe bats and jumped into palm civets and then spread globally. Uh, we had then after SARS, we had MERS, which emerged in 2012, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, and this table here is also showing that MERS had a much higher case fatality rate of 34 percent, though much smaller uh, impact. There were only 2,000 cases and about uh, uh, 858 deaths. Um, but what was interesting about MERS versus SARS is that there was a higher proportion of nosocomial transmission, means transmission within hospitals. Um, MERS was transmitted uh, from horseshoe bats to camels and was primarily um, focused in Saudi Arabia, although there were some cases outside of the Middle East. Okay, I'm going to just um, tell you a little bit about the emergence of SARS and MERS. Um, or of, of uh, COVID-19. Um, so what we know here is that uh, uh, we now have this uh, COVID-19 outbreak here. It, the first case was hospitalized on December 17th uh, in Wuhan. Uh, we know that we uh, had clusters reported as of December 30th. Um, what we realized was that from the um, it was linked originally to a wholesale seafood market, uh, but we have since found that there were cases that happened previously before that, so we're not exactly sure, but it, it seemed to emerge around that time. Um, on January 23rd, there was a cordon sanitaire implemented in Wuhan and the surrounding cities, and 50 million people were, uh, were quarantined. And on the 30th of January, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, we have since that time seen cases spread throughout the world. Uh, the cases are, uh, case counts are changing daily, uh, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, one of the big questions that we have about uh, COVID-19 is about transmission. Uh, what we do know, it is it appears to be, uh, transmission appears to be similar to seasonal influenza. Uh, it's mostly by droplet transmission, which occurs when bacteria or viruses will uh, travel on a relatively large uh, respiratory droplet when people sneeze or cough or exhale, and uh, these droplets are generally loaded with lots of particles. Um, so people sneeze, they cough, um, even when talking, these, uh, these droplets can be transmitted. Uh, you can also transmit it when coughing or sneezing into your hands, touching other things. Um, we know that surfaces also can be contaminated. Uh, and there is some question about smaller droplet spread and gastrointestinal spread as, spread as well. Okay, so this is what we have thought to date, but what we're thinking, but, what, but recent studies just that were just published today have suggested that travel distance is uh, potentially two times farther than originally anticipated. Um, there are some questions about whether or not uh, this can linger in the air for a longer period of time than previously um, thought, um, and that the uh, transmission may be up to 15 feet, um, and that, that, that these um, respiratory droplets can land on surfaces and last for several days. 
Um, what we do know with coronaviruses in general, that they can survive for two to three days on glass, fabric, metal, plastic, and paper. Um, and so in China, um, they have made uh, recommendations to wear face masks on buses uh, at, at, uh, at present. The reason that we worry about COVID-19 um, is that the reproductive number um, is, is still debatable. Um, right now, the reproductive number, which is the average number of people who will catch the disease from a single infected person in a population that's never seen disease before, um, is estimated to be around two to three people. Um, so that means that for every person that's infected, they have the opportunity on average to, uh, to infect two to three people in addition. Um, now, what's interesting about this is when you compare it to something like seasonal influenza. Seasonal influenza, season, the reproductive number of seasonal influenza is approximately 1.2, 1.3. And so that means with seasonal influenza, we might transmit it to one or two people, um, but it seems that COVID-19 appears to be much more infectious. Um, just to, to for, for comparison's sake, also comparing H1N1 influenza, the reproductive rate was 1.4 to 1.6. So um, from what we understand right now, the, uh, the reproductive rate appears to be greater than influenza. Um, what we also know is that at, at present, and I should be very clear that we still are waiting to understand a lot more about this. There has not been a lot of data that has been um, uh, that, that is well understood yet, and a lot of data are coming in. Now that COVID-19 has spread to many countries, we'll be learning a lot more about how it, how it uh, spreads. But right now, we assume that the incubation period is approximately 5.1 days, um, and that symptomatic individuals will develop symptoms within about 11 to 12 days. Um, most people report fever, cough, shortness of breath, muscle aches, um, but one of the big questions that we have are how many people are asymptomatic. Right now we don't know. When we think about um, how severe this kind of illness could be, um, what we understand right now is that um, most people, approximately 81% of people um, infected, um, will get a mild infection or a mild disease. But mild disease, um, in terms of the, the definition of mild disease, also does include mild pneumonia. So this is not a, a disease that um, we're, we're just talking about cough and cold when we talk about 81% getting mild disease. 14% um, can, can uh, appear to have critical disease. And then uh, approximately 5% could be, could be critical. Um, there are a lot of questions about the case fatality rate right now. Um, originally, the estimates were around 2.3%, but WHO has recently updated them to 3.4%. I think that the big question here um, is how many people are in the numerator, the number of people who actually are um, dying, and how many people are in the denominator. And the denominator would be how many people are actually infected. And that was what we really don't know at this point. Um, and I think that that's where it comes into play. How many people are having mild disease that, that is enough where they might get a test and get reported? Um, how many people have mild disease and just think that they had a cough or a cold or some sort of flu? We don't know. And then there's this other question about how many people have asymptomatic infection. An asymptomatic infection would mean that nobody has signs or symptoms but are, are, are actually sick. And so it's very possible that this case fatality rate could be much, much lower which would be very good news for all of us. Um, case fatality rate, if you assume um, that you have a large proportion of people who have very mild disease, just something like a cough or a cold that they might not report, they might not get tested, or people who have no signs or symptoms at all, um, this, this case fatality rate could go down significantly because then the number of people that you're counting becomes much, much greater. Okay, so here, we have a slide that's showing case counts from around the world. Um, and what we see here, and this is from the Johns Hopkins um, global case count, um, we see right now we're somewhere around 110,000, 111,000 cases, um, total number of deaths, 3,892. Um, 
so I think what's really important to think about here is if the total deaths are 3,892 and the total confirmed are, are, a, are over 100,000, if really we have a lot of asymptomatic cases or a lot of very, very mild cases that are not being tested, you can see that the number would go down significantly over time. So I think it's really important for everybody just to understand we really are in the learning phase and we really do not have um, enough information. Um, you know, everybody is putting information out here and we're doing the very, very best we can um, to make sense of this information. But I think it brings me to this next point, which is the next slide, um, which is that really accurate case counts are needed to inform government decision making. And right now, we really do not have this information. Um, so everybody is doing the best that they can. We're all looking for, um, for uh, you know, the most accurate case counts possible. But right now, we're still in the learning phase. Um, case counting is not a simple effort. Um, it is something that is very, very difficult because of a variety of, you have, we have a variety of reasons for that. Um, number one, um, people that uh, are, are, are sick have to present themselves. They have to get tested for which actually count as a case. Um, but right now, um, not everybody is going to be presenting themselves and we may run into a lot of issues coming forward. Where uh, presenting yourself for a test may create stigma, and I, my colleague Gil, uh, Dr. G is going to talk about that. Um, but really, um, what, we're, what, we, uh, what we need to know is how many cases there are. So if you find a case, then you have to do contact tracing. And contact tracing can be very difficult as well, because that person has to be able to tell you however, how many people they were in contact with. Um, and that's going to become more and more difficult uh, as we see more cases. And what we'll see is cases that appear in the community where people do not know where they got it from. And that's what we call community spread. Um, I think that this is a very important point that we're going to have to think about and think about how we're going to manage the outbreak as we move from just case here, case there, looking at, at being able to trace the contacts to real community transmission. And once we have community transmission, we really have to think about how this is being managed um, and, and who is going to be um, accurately keeping track of case counts. Um, county will be, uh, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health will be managing this, but they're going to be managing information from many, many places. And it's going to be really important that cities are being very, very helpful to the county in terms of being able to keep these um, numbers straight and getting as much information as possible. Okay. So one of the big concerns that we all have is that as cases continue to increase, the healthcare system will begin to be overburdened. And to me, this is one of the biggest issues that I think is important for everybody to think about during this outbreak. Um, one of the reasons that, we're, that, that this is um, important to think about um, is because it's not just about how many cases of, of COVID-19 that we have, it's how our health system is going to be able to handle that. So right now, um, it's flu season. We have most of our hospitals already at or around capacity. Um, there are lots of admissions at this time of year. If we end up with, depending upon how contagious this, vaccine, this disease really is and how many people we see getting sick, how many people are sick enough to need hospital care, our hospitals are going to reach the tipping point and they're going to be very, they're going to be overburdened very, very quickly. And if that's the case, um, you know, people that are coming in with heart attacks, with broken legs, with stroke, with any other um, uh, um, issue are going to have trouble finding beds. And so I think it's very important for the city to be thinking about, well, how many beds do we have and how many, how many ICU, how many regular hospital beds do we have? How many ICU beds do we have? Um, how many critical care facilities do we have? Um, what, what are we thinking about in terms of um, urgent care facilities around, around here as well? Because they're all going to be overburdened if we see, um, see uh, COVID-19 spreading here as it has in Italy or in um, China. Um, this this slide here, I think, is, 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 a, is a good one to look at um, because with this in mind, that's how we have to think about what we want to do next. And I think what we want to really do is we want to flatten the curve. We want to make sure that we get as many control measures into place and slow the spread of the outbreak or the epidemic as much as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, ways to do that are 
uh, social distancing, which have, we've been discussing more recently, which means um, making sure that, that large events are canceled in some places and and that we we try and find other ways for for meetings to occur large groups of meeting you know, meetings with large groups of people um, and uh, maybe thinking rethinking how we want to um, promote events etc or cancel them as the case may be um, also protective measures means um, everybody doing their part washing their hands regularly um, using uh, uh, um, anti um, using um, um, Purell or other um, uh, hand sanitizers I think uh, you know teaching people not to touch their face too much um, and also staying home when possible when they are ill now staying home when possible um, is really a luxury for many people and so I think that this is something that the city really needs to think about very very carefully because when people need to stay home we're telling people that they need to stay home um, for many people means that they're not going to be able to to earn their their living and so if people are not able to stay home you know, we need to think about what other solutions there are, what other recommendations there are for them. I, you know, personally do not have the um, ability to make those recommendations. I mean, I can think of many things that people could do. Maybe when you're sick, that's when you do wear a mask. Maybe when you're sick, you do try social distancing as best, or distancing from other people as much as you can. But there are going to be many issues to be considered um, because just saying stay home when you're ill just may not be an option for people. Um, so talking a little bit more about hospital preparedness for influx of patients, um, you know, I, I think that um, this goes beyond just hospitals. We need to think about nursing homes, um, facilities, you know, there are um, other facilities um, where, where people who will be at risk um, will be will be placed, and I think it's going to be very, very important to be thinking about that. Um, in particular, nursing facilities we, we need to think about because we have older people who are at great risk for contracting infection um, and for having poor outcomes. Um, I think um, we need to start messaging uh, about people about, as Tom Frieden did just the other day, that it's time to restrict visits to nursing homes, so I think we just really need to think very carefully about this. Um, and how we want to message people because we also do not want uh, people in nursing homes to feel isolated and I think that that's going to be another issue that will come into play. Um, some of the other things that we need to think about are um, hospital overflows if that should happen um, and what is available and what places might be available to be able to put people if they are sick and um, the um, hospitals are overburdened. Uh, we also need to think about our ambulances and how we're going to make sure that our EMTs and fire um, people who are in the fire department or other places are able to protect themselves if they're coming to um, rescue people or work on people who may be infected um, or may be even asymptomatically infected with COVID-19. Um, one of the big questions that people have been asking is about the COVID-19 tests. Um, and there are a lot of questions. Um, this is rapidly evolving. Um, we, we will need to have good messaging out there about who is uh, eligible for testing, um, how, um, where testing is happening, um, how many tests are available to LA hospitals or to urgent care facilities, um, and uh, basically to, to make sure that the public knows when they should be going to get tested and if they should be going to get tested at all, because otherwise you're gonna have all of these emergency rooms swamped um, and that's going to create a lot of chaos and a lot of difficulty in terms of being able to triage. Um, so I think that the, the key is, is that we have to have um, the ability to act um, in a coordinated way and to be able to um, have LA City uh, be coordinating well with all of the hospitals in the area, all of the urgent care facilities in the area, and to um, make sure uh, that messaging happens very clearly. Um, so when we think about some of the messaging, uh, we need to think about how we're going to be dealing with closings, um, you know, schools, work, public transit. Um, you can't cancel one without it impacting the others. Um, 
there will be some businesses that may need to um, think about how they may close. Should there be a great need? Um, should uh, um, businesses have people who are ill in their um, in their um, workforce? How they're going to um, how are they going to think about their policies and what they're going to do? Um, how they're going to how we need to be able to encourage businesses to be better at having. Um, lenient sick policies um, for the better health of their, uh, the rest of their employees and for the public. Um, and so I think that the important thing too is to make sure that messaging is clear. Um, the key issue is going to be how you have good uh, containment of the virus methods without disenfranchising Angelinos and I think that that's really going to be critical. Um, the way that you want to make sure that you do this is have special populations will need special protocols with special consideration. Um, and those considerations should um, include um, um, how if at-risk populations are not considered in an outbreak plan, um, then they will continue to use transit, go to work, not seek, seek sick care, um, sick care, seek care if sick. And this could certainly um, prolong an out, an, the epidemic. Um, and I think it's going to be also very important to be sure that containment efforts shouldn't disproportionately disenfranchise certain populations, especially vulnerable populations. Um, speaking of vulnerable populations, one of the populations that we have to think very carefully are homeless populations. Um, you know, the, the, um, the fact that they are congregating um, um, in, in areas, certain areas, and that there are shared bathrooms of shelters make them ripe for spread of disease. So not only locally on the street do we have to worry about the homeless, but we do also have to worry about um, shelters as a place where there could be rapid disease spread, um, something that's very important to think about. Um, we also need to think about detained populations, prison populations, um, jails, ICE detention facilities. They'll need their own protocols. This is going to be very important. But the key here is that early and preventative actions are going to be critical. I just want to make a, a, a point here about why we need to be thinking about um, about uh, social distancing and how important it is. Um, there have been, um, this is actually something that, that I had uh, learned a long time ago, but a colleague of mine um, posted on Twitter recently. So I have to say that Twitter has been very helpful in terms of remembering some very important pieces of public health. Um, but um, the, the, the key here is that in, during the 1918 flu pandemic, Philadelphia hosted a, um, a parade at the end of World War I. And that citywide parade um, was actually a, um, a very important moment. The, the city downplayed the severity of disease, they held this parade, and they were not careful about social distancing interventions. Um, social distancing interventions were not put in place until uh, a few weeks later. Um, and whereas St. Louis reacted quickly and they canceled their parade. And so you can see here on this slide how the uh, outbreak played out in Philadelphia. There was a huge spike, whereas in uh, St. Louis uh, the outbreak was much smaller and uh, much more manageable. So I think we need to be thinking about this when we think about having big events, is do we want to be Philadelphia or do we want to be St. Louis? So I think that this is just a, a really important point to think about. Um, I know that there's a lot, of, a lot of data that is still forthcoming. We're going to be learning a lot in the next couple of days, but I think that the key here is how we act early um, is going to be very, very important in how the epidemic plays out here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for a very uh, thorough and uh, uh, excellent uh, overview of, of the disease and the spread. I think for logistically we'll have uh, Professor G speak first and then we'll uh, open up for questions afterwards. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak this evening. Um, I do want to talk about the issue of racism, prejudice, xenophobia, and how it affects our communities. I'm sure you've heard from many of your constituents that Many people are experiencing various kinds of discrimination from outright hate crimes to minor uh, insults and assaults and things like that. And I want to put all of this into a bigger perspective. 
So I'm just going to talk about three things. One is really the historic origins of connecting race and disease and racism. Then I want to say just a couple words about why we should care about this. And finally, to broaden this so that we're not just really focused on Asian Americans. Okay, so there's a long history of using science and medicine to essentially, quote unquote, prove that certain racial groups are inferior. And so there's a long history of research on a pseudoscience called phrenology that would look at, say, the bumps on people's heads and make conclusions about intelligence and things like that. And there are many people involved in this whole industry of using science to kind of make these kind of statements to buttress racism and up uphold things like slavery. Next slide. And in fact, for example, doctors like Samuel Cartwright in 1851 wrote, it's not only in the skin that a difference of color exists between the Negro and the white man, but in the membranes, the muscles, the tendons, and all the fluids and secretions. Even the Negro's brain and, ch and nerves and chide and all the humors are tinctured with a shade of pervading darkness. What's important about Samuel Cartwright was he was not a kook. He was actually in part of the medical mainstream. So he was just espousing ideas that many other medical practitioners and scientists were believing in, and there was a whole industry of this kind of research. Next slide. And certainly, this was not limited to people from Africa. So for example, a dermatologist, uh, Prince Morrow, wrote, China has been the breeding place and nursery of pestilential diseases, cholera plague, as well as leprosy from time immortal. These pigtailed argonauts of the Orient have invaded many lands, and almost every land they have touched have been tainted with leprosy. So it's this kind of long-standing backdrop of medical and scientific research that has really tried to say it's okay to connect race and racism. A lot of these ideas were used to justify slavery. How could we, as a democratic society, the land of the free and the brave, have slaves? And part of it was to use research to suggest that racial groups were inferior, and but for the beneficence, if you will, of slave owners, the African race would disintegrate on its own. They would degenerate. This was part of the thinking that was there. Next slide, please. And so lots of uh, connections have been made between racial groups and specific diseases. And here again, there is a connection, uh, just to illustrate this connection between Chinese persons and issues like leprosy. This was put into medical textbooks in not only the United States, but in many other places. Next slide. And so a couple years ago, you know, we had another outbreak, SARS, and members of the Asian community were mentioning many experiences that we hear echoing today. And so this was an article that was published in the New York Times where many Asian Americans were talking about, were, were mentioning being singled out and discriminated against. Uh, I won't read that. Next slide. And today, of course, many of you have heard that there's a lot of chatter on social media as well as in our communities. And so here's an example of something that emerged on Twitter. And I'm actually working with some computer scientists to try to uh, track some of these uh, statements. But for, this is one example where somebody says, hey, why don't we just drop the atomic bomb on these chinks and stop the coronavirus for good? Okay. And so here, you know, we have citizens kind of making statements like this. But they also have certainly not only sort of big picture effects at the global level, but also at the local level. Next slide. Um, I don't know if you've heard a bit about this, but this just happened over the past weekend at one of the local high schools here in LA. Uh, there was a big incident where essentially two students, two high school students, were essentially, in, in this case, this is a clip from the video where the woman on the right side, you used to only see her hair, she's actually hitting the other Asian student on the mouth. And so that school itself has issued a statement of non-discrimination, but there's also lots and lots of examples like this. And I'm sure many of you have heard examples like this from your own constituents. And so these are things that you know, we certainly care about. So why should we care about this whole conversation of racism and all this? So first of all, I think many of us would agree that racism is intrinsically bad. You know, for issues of morality and social justice that many of us would agree that a just and civil society, we should do certainly better. But also research is showing that experiencing discrimination actually can make you sick. And it can make you sicker if you're already sick. So research is showing that people who experience discrimination have increased thickening of the coronary uh, arteries, 
Uh, there's in evidence of cellular aging, accelerated cellular aging. There's all these biomarkers of things called C-reactive proteins and things like that that are essentially biomarkers of stress and accelerated aging and precursors of clinical disease. And in many studies we're, are showing that experiences of discrimination are related to things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, premature death, mental illness, substance use, and whatnot. And these studies are emerging not only in the United States, but also around the world. So there's a lot of evidence to show that discrimination is actually a public health threat. And finally, discrimination skews our understanding of lethality. So my colleague mentioned the case fatality ratio, right? And so we want to know how, how lethal is COVID-19? If you get it, how likely are you to die? We, we all want to know that. Well, discrimination can totally throw off our statistics because it's a simple calculation where the numerator is how many people die and the denominator is how many people are infected, right? So, but the problem is if people are experiencing discrimination, they might not want to see their doctor. They may just end up hiding. And so what we're, th what we're doing is we're throwing off the denominator, even possibly throwing off the numerator. And so if a lot of people are in hiding because of discrimination, we might actually think that this disease is more lethal than it actually is. So that's a possible spillover effect of, of uh, d discrimination. And another reason why we should really be paying close attention to uh, these statements about non-discrimination and policies that buttress that. Next slide. And probably the third point I want to make is that this is not simply an issue of facing the Asian American community today. And so here are some examples from social media uh, that I'm just going to just briefly mention, but it's having spillover effects to other communities like the Latinx community. So for example, one person on social media wrote, because those Mexican murderers and rapists are also at the corona epicenter, um, and I'm sorry for all these kinds of quotes, but this is emerging simultaneously with all the incidences you are hearing about the Asian community. And I won't go through all the rest, but if you start to surf social media, you will find other examples of things such as this. So this is something that touches many, many communities, and it's not just simply that of the Chinese and Asian American community. Next slide. And so we will, over the next course of history, keep encountering new pathogens. New diseases will inevitably occur over time. We, that's just the nature of the world that we live in. You know, especially because business and commerce travels to all four corners of the earth, new diseases will emerge and new communities will be affected. Right? We have moved from a time when we called AIDS GRID. And GRID, as maybe a reminder for some of us, is gay-related immune disease. And we decided that we didn't want to stigmatize a community by labeling a disease in their name. That's why we've moved away from nomenclature like the Wuhan virus to COVID-19 to be more neutral. The WHO has enacted a policy like that. And whatever the next disease is, wherever it emerges, will inevitably affect another community, and it may certainly racially target and discriminate against the next community. So this is something that we should all be concerned about. And all our efforts to combat discrimination and to encourage people to be more empathetic and friendly to each other um, and avoid the kinds of discrimination and call that out is important not only as a civil rights issue, but as a public health issue as well. So thank you for your time.